beautiful homemakers. We are continuing with pamphlet three, chapter six, overcoming social barriers. Let us suppose again that your particular handicap is not the consciousness of poverty, but the consciousness of your lack of education or of social training. This handicap too must be examined from all sides must be realized to be comparatively unimportant, and must become so familiar to you that you can grow contemptuous of it. True education is the acquirement of character, not the memorizing of a few facts and figures. Everyone, including yourself, receives an education before reaching maturity, but no two people receive the same education. Your education, if it has developed an admirable character, is just as good as the education of your neighbor, though the latter may have delved into a few more books. Look around you. Is it the bookworms who are the honored and respected members of your community? No, it's the people of character. People who are something and do something. Not those who merely know something. If you are self-conscious because of a fear that your speech lacks good grammar and otherwise brands you as uneducated, forget this also. People of the best education lapse frequently into ungrammatical speech. And in most circles of young people nowadays, you would be looked upon as odd if you didn't indulge in carelessness of language. You may depend upon it that your mistakes will, in 99 cases out of a 100, pass unnoticed if you don't call attention to them by your embarrassment. How to be a charming talker. Or perhaps your trepidation is due to the fact that you are not a good conversationalist. The talk turns to music or art or travel or baseball or golf or fishing or social activities and you simply can't find a thing to say. You feel as if you were tongue-tied. The best way to overcome this feeling is to listen carefully for a while to the conversation of the other girls. Take every remark of these girls and see if it is as wonderful as you have imagined. You will find that hardly any of their utterances was worth saying, that you yourself could have said as much or more but that in your case you didn't have the presumption to utter such inanity. You will find, too, that few of them know any more about the subjects of conversation than you do, but that they talk whether they know anything or not, whether they have anything to say or not. If the conversation turns to a subject which is unfamiliar to them, they make an irrelevant remark and turn the discourse if it may be called such, into another channel. The idea that you can't talk as well as other girls is simply an hallucination of yours. But if you find yourself unable to get rid of this hallucination, you can make yourself a good conversationalist. It is not very hard. Mind you, we maintain that it is wholly unnecessary and superfluous for you to be a conversational star. But if you think you must be one in order to be accepted socially, there is probably no other cure for you. There is perhaps no other way of eradicating your diffidence and backwardness. Therefore, though we give here a few suggestions for developing your conversational ability, we want you to bear in mind that unless you find it impossible otherwise to build up your self-assurance, we do not recommend your wasting much time upon them. Becoming a conversationalist, like becoming anything else, is a matter of practice. Has it ever occurred to you to practice conversation? Most likely not. Most likely, too, you wonder why, when you want to tell a joke that you once laughed over, you can't remember it. This is simply because you haven't practiced remembering jokes. Try this plan, therefore, and see how much easier it will become. The next time you read or hear a joke that strikes you as good, determine then and there to tell it to someone else at the first opportunity. Repeat the joke to yourself at once. Fix it firmly in mind, 
Rehearse it once or twice during the remainder of the day, and before it escapes you, tell it to someone, then to someone else, and so ad infinitum. All good storytellers unconsciously do the same thing. Their memories would be as bad as yours if they merely laughed upon hearing a new story, and then proceeded to throw all thought of it out of their minds. A good conversationalist, the minute he hears something new, goes back over it, analyzes it, chuckles to himself over it a second time, and firmly fixes it in his mind as a precious addition to his stock in trade. No wonder, then, that he seems to have such an illimitable store. You cannot expect to shine as a conversationalist until you do as he does. There are other ways in which to practice your conversational abilities. The minute you read or discover something of interest, pass it along to this one and that one and still another. With every retelling of the same thing, you will improve conversationally. Ordinary conversation never requires a profound knowledge of any subject. You can pick up a musical magazine, read a few personal items about music and musicians, and converse interestingly even though your knowledge of music is exceedingly limited. You might speak even more interestingly than one who has devoted a lifetime to the study of music. Similarly, after reading a little gossip on the subjects, you can speak with ease upon art, literature, sports, and any other matter. To be a conversationalist requires no great amount of education, but only a superficial knowledge of subjects of general interest. After you have read something of interest, don't turn immediately to something else. Go back over it with the intention of picking out the items which you intend telling to the first person you meet, and fix them in mind. Then tell your story to one person after another, in a different way each time, in order to learn which way seems the most effective. Observing how different people respond to the same story will increase your knowledge of human nature, the most important branch of learning there is, the most valuable, and the most useful to you in your purpose of winning men. Now there's an interesting book by Rachel Greenwald called Why He Didn't Call You Back. And if I remember correctly, she's a matchmaker. And so she could get the real scoop about why he wasn't going, why he didn't call her back. She talked to both parties and this book documents some of her conversations. It's an interesting book. But the thing I liked most about it was this 20 creative questions to ask your date that won't make him yawn. I'm not gonna read all of them, but some of them I thought were really good, such as, what was your favorite toy as a kid? Often that's going to bring up some enjoyable memories and not many people are going to ask him that. Even if you're married and you're with your husband at dinner and he wants to pull out his phone or you just know each other so well that conversation is lagging, these are questions you can ask your own husband. What was your favorite toy as a kid? What's the best gift you ever gave someone? What's one place you've never been but really want to go to? What did you want to be when you grew up? In addition to the, you know, all-time favorite movies and books, what was the worst job you ever had? What's the best advice anyone ever gave you? What's your favorite board game? If you could live outside your country, where would you live? What's the best birthday you ever had? What was your best Halloween costume? What's the bravest thing you've ever done? What was the most fun vacation you've had? And what was the luckiest thing that ever happened to you? Keep in the back of your mind special questions like that to really get to know people and have a very interesting conversation. The way to self-confidence. It is now established that no matter what handicaps of circumstances you suffer, you are not to think meanly of yourself. 
We now come to the second half of the rule for maintaining a perfect pride, that is, not to think meanly of others. If you have taken to heart the lessons in Chapter 5, you have already made great progress in this direction. The game of winning hearts, outlined in that chapter, will prove invaluable to you. If, in playing this game, you seek for and find the things to appreciate in everyone with whom you come in contact, you will certainly not think meanly of them. Moreover, in finding ways to show that you appreciate the best in people, you will lose most of your self-consciousness, if you have any. You will be thinking of them, not of yourself. And this is the only healthy way of thinking. Picking out the points on which they are eager for praise and amenable to appreciation, picking out the weaknesses of their human nature through which they can be approached and influenced, and then using that knowledge to make them like you, gives you a sense of superiority over them, a feeling that you not only are able to take care of yourself, but have a powerful influence over others, a self-confidence and a self-reliance that nothing else on earth can give. The foundation of the insuperable self-confidence of the master salesman is the same feeling. The realization that all others are mere parcels of weak human nature on which he can play it well. Sufficient exercise in this game will make you feel toward each of your acquaintances, as the violinist does toward his violin, that here is an instrument over which you have complete mastery and upon which you can play any time you desire. The maintenance of your pride and self-respect under such circumstances is an easy matter. Now you could take this paragraph and make something terrible out of it. However, they're talking about looking at the good in people and bringing it out in them and thus it brings it out in yourself. I don't really care for some of their word choices like playing people like a violin, but I hope you take away the gist of the conversation. When you are able to converse and talk with people and bring the best out in them, it gives you superlative self-confidence. The secret of success in society. Remember, however, that everyone is a human being entitled to respect and reverence as such, and that there is not on earth anything nobler, finer, and lovelier than a human being. The higher your conception is of human beings in general, the higher will be your pride in yourself as one of them. And I feel like many people today do not have love of their fellow human beings. And there are some people in the world today that want to get rid of humans in favor of the earth and animals, as though humans should be wiped out. To show a lack of courteous appreciation of anyone you meet is only to show a decline in the quick intelligence and fine perception expected of a cultured person. Nothing else is more quickly calculated to give you a coarse, vulgar, and wholly unattractive character. The best way to indicate the high respect you have for people you meet is to make a sincere effort to win their own respect for you. This will require that you avoid anything and everything likely to hurt their feelings. Every omission of form or manners indicative of indifference to their good opinion, every suggestion and act and word of a lack of appreciation of what they may consider important. If, for example, you meet a prim little old lady whose lifetime has been devoted to a worship of the conventions, don't show by trampling on those conventions disrespect for her sensitiveness. If you dine with some honest soul who prides herself on her cooking, don't refuse a second helping or let her surmise from any other action that you are less than delighted with her culinaries. If a hostess is anxious that her guests should be impressed with the culture and refinement of her home, do not frustrate her hopes by boisterous conduct or unkind argument. 
If, on the contrary, her thoughts are centered mainly on everyone's having an uproariously good time, help her out by being uproariously jolly yourself. The most flattering and agreeable thing you can do for anyone you meet is to show a genuine delight in his or her society and to endeavor at the same time to make others share your delight. The secret of success in society, writes Emerson, is a certain heartiness and sympathy. A man who is not happy in company cannot find any word in his memory that will fit the occasion. All his information is a little impertinent. A man who is happy there finds in every turn of the conversation equally lucky occasions for the introduction of that which he has to say. The favorites of society, and what it calls its whole souls, are able men, and of more spirit than wit, who have no uncomfortable egotism, but who exactly fill the hour and the company, contented and contenting, at a marriage or a funeral, a ball or a jury, a water party or a shooting match. I love how this chapter ends with contented and contenting in whatever situation you find yourself in your marriage, in your dating, at a funeral, at a wedding, at home, or out in the community. And that is the end of pamphlet three, chapters five and six. And a summary is given in the 1935 version. One is be physically healthy. Two, be mentally healthy. Three, be joyous and sympathetic. Four, learn the definition of a really beautiful character. Five, learn self-respect and proper pride. Six, be agreeable. Seven, say, I'm going to be instead of, I wish I were. Too many people today are offended instead of just being agreeable. They get upset about every little thing instead of just letting it shake off their shoulders. And I would say that the number one thing a man is looking for in a woman is a woman who can be pleased. A woman who is grateful and thankful for what he provides, for the gifts he gives, etc. Just the other day, we were talking about jewelry, and I mentioned how when we were first married, someone came over and was showing off the jewelry that their husband had given them for Christmas. And my husband, I don't know if he felt bad that he didn't give me jewelry, but he mentioned something about it. And I said, oh yeah, I, I would love to get jewelry for Christmas. So, since that time, I've received lots of jewelry over the years. Not every Christmas, not every birthday, just every once in a while, but plenty. And the lady said to me, oh, I would never trust my husband to pick me out jewelry. In fact, I don't trust him to pick out anything for me. That is not being pleasable. That means you're not going to be getting gifts. If you reject gifts, then they're not going to come your way anymore. But no matter what he gives you, if you accept it and love it and wear it, you're going to receive more. For one birthday, I received a very ornate necklace in my birthstone, and I knew it was too ornate to wear most places, and I very rarely have a chance to wear it. But when we go out on special occasions, I will wear it, including when we go out to breakfast on Valentine's Day morning at the coffee shop at the public golf course down the street, because it's a gift from my honey, and it is perfectly acceptable for me to wear it whenever I want. And I think I should address this question because I'm sure someone is asking it. What do you do if he gives you something that you just don't like? You don't like the color, you don't like the style, you feel that it's too expensive. And my answer is ask him about it. Ask him why he chose it. For instance, once I received a bathrobe, and it was the ugliest color, almost purple-gray. My first inclination was, why would you pick out such an ugly bathrobe for me? The second thing that came to my mind was, 
why are you buying me a bathrobe? I never use a bathrobe. The only time I wear a bathrobe is when I'm sick. But instead, having worked on these skills, I said, wow, I love how soft this bathrobe is. What made you buy me a bathrobe? His reply was, I think you need a new one. He said, I called you and asked you about the color and you said that you'd like lavender best. Out of pink, blue, yellow, or lavender, I chose lavender. But this was ugly. And I said, wow, I wouldn't really call this lavender. He said, let me show you the picture of what it was supposed to look like. And on the internet, oh, it looked beautiful. It was a beautiful lavender. I would have loved it. But this was not that. So I said, I love the robe, and I'm looking forward to wearing it. But do you think we could send this back and choose a different color? Of course, he immediately agreed, and I love my new bathrobe. But what if on that necklace he gave me, I had said, this necklace is too fancy. Where am I going to wear this? He would have been hurt. He chose a necklace for me that was fit for a princess. That's how he viewed me. He was showing me his love through jewelry. Do you think I would have received jewelry after that? Of course not. Instead, I wear it whenever I can. If you feel that you cannot accept graciously a gift from your husband, think about if the tables were turned and you gave him a gift that you thought would be great, but he's saying, where do you expect me to wear this? This isn't my style. And you, you're saying, but I think you would look good in it, and it matches your eyes. There's a reason you bought it. There's a reason he bought that for you. Find out the reason. If he gives you something that you think is too expensive, well, obviously it isn't, because he bought it for you, and he felt that he could afford it. Accept gifts graciously. And teach your children how to accept gifts graciously by practicing with them. Wrap up a tube of toothpaste. Have them practice finding compliments for unusual gifts. It really will come in handy, I promise. I also want to give a shout out to Laura over at lauradoyle.com who talks about accepting gifts graciously. So I'm going to say it again in a different way. Be as physically healthy as you can. Do what's necessary to ensure that you're getting sunshine, water, and plenty of sleep. That you're getting your supplements. That you're eating healthy food for your body. Be mentally healthy by knowing what you stand for and not being swayed against your convictions. That would be tacit compliance when you don't speak up even though you know better. Be joyous. Men are looking for women who are joyful. That's one of their number one things that they look for in a woman. Be sympathetic. Men expect their women to be kind. Good men put good women on pedestals. And when you're unkind or when you're when you complain a lot, when you want to get an employee at a restaurant in trouble because she didn't get your order right or she slighted you in some way. You've just fallen off your pedestal. Develop a really beautiful character. And this is much easier to do when you surround yourself with good literature and stay away from the things that bring you down. I don't watch the news, but ha I listen to one man every night who aggregates the news. I'm in the loop, but I'm not downtrodden by the news. Learn self-respect and proper pride. Seems like we have an awful lot of people with improper pride. They're haughty instead of filled with grace. Be agreeable. When you go on a date with a man, you're not planning the date. You're not telling him how to drive. You're not choosing the restaurant. He's doing all that, and you just go along with it. You're agreeable. And then when you get to know him more and more, well, you start putting your finger in the pie a lot. And it's one thing to say, I like Mexican food. I like Greek food. I like Chinese food. But I don't like seafood. Whatever your preferences are, that's fine. 
My husband took me to a very fancy seafood restaurant on our first date, and all I could order was the salad. But that was fine. I made the best of it. I was too nervous to eat anyways. Be agreeable. Be pleasable. Part of being pleasable doesn't mean that he walks all over you. Not at all. Being pleasable means you're just taking care of yourself. You aren't on his page taking care of the things he should be taking care of because that's going to make you angry. That's going to put too much on your shoulders. In order to remain agreeable and pleasable, you have to take care of yourself. You have to have time for yourself. Now, this doesn't mean constant selfishness, but it does mean taking time for yourself to keep yourself stable and sane in a world that moves very quickly. And the last one was, say I'm going to be instead of I wish I were. And that takes practice. So right now, even by listening to this book, you're moving from I'm going to be instead of I wish I were. Every day we take baby steps toward who we want to become. And remember, it goes much easier when your day begins with prayer. Pray to become the woman God wants you to be. Bye!